Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Sarah Isger, that's Steve Hayes and Jonah Goldberg, and we're doing a special, limited, 4th of July edition of the podcast. Let's start with something really important. Steve and Jonah, what are your 4th of July traditions and recommendations for people, um, you know, what they should be reading aloud to their family, eating, whatever? Um, Okay, so traditions, I used to, uh, for the longest time... When my mom was still alive, we would go to her place in Weehawken because it has the best view of the fireworks on the Hudson. Um, imaginable. But also, and um, and then um, did you do dual reenactments? Uh, a little bit, you know. It's, we talk about it. Uh, and then um, <laughs> the problem is Bill De Blasio because he's a Brooklyn uh, jingoist. He moved it to the East River, and that kind of ruined that for a while. Mm. Um. I live in a neighborhood where the MacArthur Boulevard Fourth of July parade is awesome, so we often go to that. Um, and if I was going to say one thing that people should read, it is Calvin Coolidge's uh, 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence speech, which I think is arguably, other than Martin Luther King's um, "I Have a Dream" speech and the Gettysburg Address, it is the is the third best statement about the Declaration of Independence ever uttered in American lore. I have not read that. I'm so excited. That's what I'm going to do. Maybe Steve? that's what we should send tomorrow uh, in the morning dispatch. Um, I am... Um, uh, our tradition had been, uh, until Charles Krauthammer's passing, we went several times to his 4th of July party um, up on the Magothy River near baltimore name dropper and well you asked what we did that's what we did (laughs) um now let me drop some names there were all sorts of people uh who attended these parties including clarence thomas and others and charles um handed out laminated copies of the declaration of independence we would stand in a circle and read the declaration aloud and it was i mean awesome in the original meaning of the word awesome and you know you got chills uh my kids were there for that loved that um and i i I miss the tradition i certainly miss charles uh we are going i think to mount vernon tomorrow um where they also have a reading of the declaration of independence 9 30 in the morning um and then we're going to spend the day at mount vernon and i think we're going to go get some frozen custard afterwards and then did you probably... hear that they just found uh preserved cherries from yeah, I did i read that yeah i read that. but you know they yeah. never answered my question did anyone try one it was weird I, the, the new segment i saw on it um just sort of skip they said oh they're so right? perfectly preserved and they're in right? great shape and you can see them and blah blah but they How never did they said not think that's the question we all had yeah I mean, who ate edible one? versus inedible would be like good to know you know well, it's, a, it's a good question. Okay, uh, and then so in terms of oh. what to read, I, I would say uh, read Jonah's G-File on Jeffrey Tubin. Um, <laughs> no, no, don't. <laughs> don't go back and read that. I was just going to say we could think of it as a celebration of, of a free press. No, don't, don't go back and read that. Um, I, I actually think sort of let's be simple and straightforward here. Go back and read the Declaration. Too many people, uh, I think, don't do that. It's very worth doing. Uh, Do you know, I was just reading it the other day because I was trying to remember one of the grievances. And then I just went, you know, once you get into the grievances, you have to read them all because they're delightful. And the order in which they're in is bewildering at times. There's like, he made us sit in uncomfortable chairs in places we didn't want to have to sit. And then like two thirds of the way down, it's he's a tyrant who kills people. And you're like, that (laughs) feels like an odd order. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a fun document because it moves in between the high minded and the very specific yeah. and the sometimes crotchety uh, and whiny. And I like all of that. All right. It has been a week in the news and in our politics, and it feels somehow fitting that it's July 4th, sort of like in the movie Independence Day, where everything is destroyed all around. And the president says, you know, we will now declare our new independence, not as a nation, but as a world. I'm paraphrasing Bill Pullman here, but you get the point. Um, It feels very much like we are living in a moment of history that we have not 
really lived in at all since LBJ announced that he uh, was not going to ex- neither seek nor accept the Democratic nomination. Uh, in the moment that we're recording this, of course, Joe Biden has said that no one is going to pressure him out of this race. But Jonah, both Steve, both of you have noted that is both what he has to say if he's not leaving and what he has to say if he is leaving the race. So can you just give us sort of your larger historical perspective on what we're experiencing right now, maybe even why this hasn't happened before, Jonah? Well, I mean, one of the reasons this hasn't happened before is for whatever reasons, we haven't had candidates this old, right? I mean, and, um, you know, we don't have to get all depressing about how much older people our ages looked 40 years ago, but like people are, are aging better. And um, the system is, I think, I think the system is producing these oldsters in part because of the dysfunctions of the system. Um, The power of incumbency and all of that is keeping these people in power way longer than they should be. And gets into all Surely the death of the political parties is also part of this. For sure. Extreme weakness of the political parties. This isn't who a robust political party would have picked two years ago to begin with. For sure. Actually, I just wrote a G file about that. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there, I don't think there are a lot of historical parallels in part because in the past, the parties were strong enough and self-disciplined enough to catch these problems earlier. In the era prior to, t- certainly the era prior to the TV, Donald Trump never would have been a nominee. Joe Biden would have been told, okay, thank you for your service. Here's your gold watch. Um, but the parties don't have the ability anymore to impose a kind of discipline on themselves. So I think, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and um, and I, I think if we were going to write the history about all this, you'd also have to look at the fact that both parties, because they don't pursue strategies of trying to appeal to a large majority, like a 60% sent in a majority they keep trying to squeak one out with 50.1 or something like that by turning up the base the kinds of politicians who have broad appeal have been eliminated right barack obama through obamacare by doing a base only democrat only push for obamacare and all that kind of stuff killed all of the moderate democrats in the south and the midwest and made the party intensely bluer donald trump has made the the republican party intensely redder and so you don't have some sort of elder statesman types who you can call off the bench to step in and you don't have elder and and you don't have elder statesman types who can come in and talk people out of making these kinds of bad decisions. So I mean I, mean, I think there are a lot of reasons but those are the ones that come Steve anything yeah, I, I agree to with add? That. Yeah, no just to pick up on on Jonah's last point. I mean it, when you look at the practical reasons that Joe Biden seems at least at this m- moment intent on sticking this out, part of it has to do with the fact that the parties, there are very few mechanisms the parties can use at this point. Um, there are very few people in the parties who, uh, there, aren't, there aren't any statesmen elder than Joe Biden, right? right? I mean, so by definition. Literally or point, figuratively, the, yeah. The irony of the why he got elected in the first place was because people thought of him as that kind of elder Correct. statesman kind of guy. Correct. Correct. So we were talking about this. Uh, I was talking about with with a group of really smart um, sort of Washington D.C. political observers yesterday, and and you know we said, so who who would it be? Who's going to make this argument? And and who's going to make an argument to Joe Biden that Joe Biden would listen to? And part of this is, I think, unique to Joe Biden. Um, you know, beyond his sort of uh, neurodegenerative condition and mental acuity problems. Um, He is a particularly prideful um, and stubborn individual. This has been true for his entire career. He's had a chip on his shoulder. He, 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 thinks of himself as Scranton Joe. You could see it in the early parts of his career when he would, you know, there's that famous exchange that was caught on video where he lambasts a voter who comes to talk to him and, you know, claims to have graduated at the top of his law school class and make all these claims. I mean, he's 
always been proving himself to people he imagines are his betters. And so the, the kind of natural people that you would expect in a moment like this to be able to prevail on Biden to do something for Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and others, not only wouldn't necessarily have that effect, but could push him in the other direction because he's such a prideful individual. And I think, you know, on the one hand, I've heard that now from several Democrats. Um, and on the one hand, it's sort of hard to imagine, like, really, if, if, if the two former living Democratic presidents came to you, you wouldn't stop and, and reconsider your obstinacy in this moment, if that's part of what's driving this. And when I push back in conversations with those Democrats, they say, yeah, that's who Joe Biden is. Um, and, and I think they're probably right. So I think that's, that explains, that's, that's the other explanation here is Biden is just so incredibly obstinate. And there aren't people, we talked about a group of, you know, he, he reveres the Senate. He talks um, in reverential terms about the Senate when he gave the eulogy for John McCain at John McCain's memorial, talked about selfless service. And he said, basically, I preferred working in the Senate to being vice president of the United States. Um, even though he had uh, legislative responsibilities as vice president. Um, and I think he meant that when he said it. But who among the senators today who served with him could go to Joe Biden and make this kind of a case? I do think we're likely to see people try um, and we're likely to, to hear about it soon. But in terms of somebody who could actually persuade him or the person who would be sort of the final word to get him to drop, it's a bit of a mystery. Let's talk politics here and just the choices that those party elders, for instance, face themselves of whether they do make a private call to him or publicly start pressuring him. Uh, the choices at this point are Joe Biden, who, you know, this idea that there's going to be some sort of rehabilitation exercise, I think, is a bit fanciful. Um, even if he, you know, if he crushes the interview with George Stephanopoulos, then the interview doesn't matter. Right. And same with the press conference. Right. It, it, when he does well, it won't matter. It's when he does poorly that it'll matter. And that will continue to happen from time to time, regardless. So you're right. And can I just inject real quick yeah. there? The 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 fact that the interview with George Stephanopoulos will be taking place. I believe it's taking place on Friday. Correct. And will air Sunday. The fact that it's being recorded eight days on and will air 10 days after. Like, that's not how you handle the kind of disaster that we saw at the debate. I mean, you're a The statement person, after the Supreme Court uh, decision. They put him out there right. on a teleprompter for three minutes, didn't take questions. Malpractice. Not, not what you would do. I mean, there's a playbook. I mean, maybe, Sarah, it would be worth dwelling for just a moment on what you would do had you been in a position to, to advise somebody who'd had that kind of catastrophic moment to try to restore faith or reassure people this is a person who can do the job, what does that look like? I mean, what would you have, have the, the principal do there? Wait, are we assuming for the purposes of this hypothetical that Biden can do the that's things? That's the problem. Yes. No, this, that's the point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I thought it was right? worth so clarifying like, that. <laughs> I can tell you what I would do if Carly Fiorina had a debate performance like that because it's Carly Fiorina, so it would actually have been one bad night. Right. Um, I will tell you a little bit about what I would have done with a Biden like candidate. You'll notice, by the way, the types of candidates that I generally worked for um, John Cornyn, Ted Cruz, Carly Fiorina, Mitt Romney, they all have some things in common um, and they're not having Joe Biden nights, um, which is why John Cornyn's probably the only one of the candidates I've worked for that's ever won. It's sad. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so the first thing I would have done is actually the stuff he is doing now, nearly a week later. The first thing you do is get on the phone and shore up your people. You call Obama and Clinton, you call Schumer, you call like sort of that core team, the people who, if they went out publicly and weren't totally sure and confident, would be the most damaging to you. Um, he appears to be making those calls today. That's an odd choice. Amazing. And Amazing. by the way, like to give an example, I actually have been in that position. You know, when the president was first tweeting that he was going to fire Jeff Sessions, for instance, we didn't wait a week within an hour on the phone, working senators to go out and say publicly that they wouldn't confirm a new attorney general. That didn't happen by accident. Um, so you work your allies first. 
get them on board, figure out the strategy that they're comfortable with and that works. That's step number one. Then you start working on the public strategy at large. Um, and I got to say, I think doing teleprompter speeches without taking questions is worse than doing nothing at all for them at this point. And, um, you know, I think I would tell my boss, and this again is why I was not the most popular comms person in the Republican Party, you take the questions, you give it without a teleprompter. If you fall on your face, better to know now. Fine, you leave the race. Right. But if you don't, then it proves that it really was a bad night. Um, and, you know, having a debate at 9 p.m. sucks. Who wants to stay up that late? I barely wanted to stay up that late to watch it. But the worst thing you can do is continue to be afraid for your principal because there's going to be bad nights. So this gets to my question. Which is politically better for the Democratic Party in terms of their chances of beating Donald Trump and, and this may be a different question, the down ballot races? One, sticking with a Joe Biden, who I think we know the limitations they are going to have on pushing back on this narrative, as they said, like the good things aren't going to count and the bad things are going to count triple. Or he uh, says he's not going to accept the Democratic nomination and it goes to Harris as the Democratic nominee sitting vice president. Or door number three, he steps down as president allows Harris to be the incumbent, be president for a few months in advance of the November election. If those were your three options and you were the senior Democrats sort of mulling amongst each other, whether you're a Democratic governor, um, these, you know, grand poobahs out there, et cetera, how would you be thinking about those three options? So can I ask a question? Are we just ruling out the possibility of option number four? Yeah, I think option number four is the right option. Go ahead Which and say is either to convince Kamala Harris to take one for the team and take herself out of consideration as well and then become a kingmaker and have an open floor you know, convention thing where Newsom and Josh Shapiro and a bunch of other people can run? Or do we just think that's so unlikely? Yeah, I'm taking that out. You don't get to pick that door. Okay. Because I'm picking it. No, no, Steve. No, you're not. <laughs> I'll tell you why. That's not a door. It's a wall. That's right. Um, <laughs> This is sort of like the, oh, Michelle Obama. Like, nope. If it's you not. actually play out how you get to something like that, I think it's really impossible to move to that world. I think it is not possible to move to a world without either Joe Biden or Kamala Harris as the nominee at this point um, because of the political damage it would cause to not have Harris, even if she quote unquote voluntarily removed herself, nobody would think that it was voluntary and they would see it as an insult and a slight. Okay, so I, I got to disagree with that too, but I, I, I think it is I think you're absolutely right. It is impossible without her cooperation. If well, she it's wants literally it, impossible in terms of the money too. Yeah, it's just impossible, and that argument wins. I think money can be used in other ways. Okay, Again, I'll shut up and listen. But she's got to cooperate, and you got to be convinced to cooperate. I think um, if she goes out there and says, all she has to do is say once. This thing is being stolen from the vice president and the first African American, blah 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 blah, and it is, and this is going to be in Chicago. Um, the whole thing just becomes the fight scene from Anchorman. Um, but if she cooperated, I'm more inclined towards door number four. I think, I, I think it is impossible to stick with Biden on the ticket between now and November, simply because it is he can't put it this way. I'm not a fan of Kamala Harris. I don't think she'd be a good nominee. I don't think she'd be a good president. I don't think she was a good choice for vice president. I think she would be bad in interviews and all that kind of stuff. But she can actually run for president. She can do the interviews. She can give speeches. She could debate Trump. I think she could probably beat Trump in a debate. People Biden... will actually listen to what she's saying versus worrying about whether yeah. her, you know, left side of her face is drooping. And plus, can you imagine? I, I think. You know, someone that's pointed out to me on Twitter when I said, look, all these other potential candidates, they're polling right now, which is all it's statistically tied with Biden, or at least it was yesterday. And people are saying, see, they don't do any better than Biden does. They're not the president of the United States. They don't have the name ID, right? They're not actually running. They haven't been picked. It seems kind of obvious to me that, again, candidate depending, almost anybody on those lists would get a five to 10 point bump the moment it was announced that they're the Democratic nominee. A lot of people in the Biden coalition would come home. Um, 
I think it would be a lot like, um, remember when Mel Carnahan died in that plane crash yep. and all of a sudden his wife just got this incredible bump by taking the, the nomination for Senate away and started to perform better than Carnahan was performing. <laughs> this is how John were... Ashcroft becomes attorney general. That's right. That's right. And, um, and that's how Sarah Isger met my wife. That's right. Because <laughs> they both work for the DOJ. But anyway, I, I think Biden can't do it because he can't run. I mean, literally, like what we think of as running for president means doing unscripted events, um, giving lots of interviews, doing debates. He cannot do those things. And also, so if we think the decline has been precipitous, you know, I, w I mentioned this interview that I saw from nine months ago. It looks very different than what we yeah. saw at that debate, which tells you sort of how quickly this is moving, whatever it may be. Um, there's four months. I mean, it's actually a very long time left at this point. Yeah. So I, I personally think you don't put, you don't have Biden resign from the presidency. You say, hey, look, the demands of campaigning are such that I cannot, for the good of my party, do this, but I can still do the job. And that gives, lets him save face in all sorts of ways. It gets him to cooperate with this plan to begin with, but I still think is a hurdle. And um, what you want to do is there's a great scene in the movie Wag the Dog where Robert De Niro is explaining that you can't bring the fake hostage home until after the election because the election is the movie ticket to see the ending that you want, right? And so you want to galvanize your voters to say she could be the first female, first African-American, female African-American president of the United States if she's already that. It takes mm. some of the fun out of and some of the incentive structure for a lot of those African-American voters, a lot of those women voters um, um, away. And um, and so having her run as vice president, I think, makes just strategically more sense if if I can't pick door number four. Steve, you so, can't pick door number four because obviously everyone would pick door number four. That's not reasonable. But if everybody would pick door number four, that includes a lot of Democrats, and there are going to be a lot of Democrats who are making this decision. So they may push people to, to door number you four. You don't get to pick door number four. I'm, I'm creating door number five then. So uh, <laughs> Joe Biden cannot stay. And I think the, the reasons that he cannot stay are obvious beyond what, what Jonah has said before. You have to imagine that if you're a Democratic elected official right now, whether you're in a competitive race or not, but particularly if you're in a competitive race, you're watching people like Chris Coons, who's one of, I think, one of Biden's six campaign co-chairs, one of his best friends, go out and try to make the case that this person who we've all seen have this massive glitch, and that's part of a long pattern of difficulties Joe Biden has had, try to make the case that that's the person who should be president. It doesn't work. You saw Jay Johnson, Obama's former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, try to do it yesterday on Morning Joe. That didn't work. And then this afternoon, we're recording this Wednesday afternoon, Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, the White House spokeswoman, went out and gave literally one of the worst White House press briefings I have ever seen. Because there's no argument for her to make. So she got to the point in answering questions from these reporters where she claimed that the reason this is a week after this, this six days after this debacle, she claimed that the reason Joe Biden struggled was because of jet lag and a cold. That's what she said. And she said it multiple times. So we know she meant it. So jet lag, I believe he had returned from his overseas trips between 12 and 13 days right. before this happened. So it's not jet lag. That's absurd. It's preposterous. And the cold claim, as I think we've mentioned here before, if the, and she acknowledged, by the way, that she was the one of the sources who told reporters during the debate. Yeah, the problem is the guy has a cold. So he, they want us to believe that the cold was so bad, so debilitating that it ruined his debate performance, but not so bad that he couldn't spend the two hours after the debate shaking hands with well-wishers, both at a, at a debate watch party that he went to. And, and the, according to Kelly O'Donnell at NBC News, he, quote unquote, worked the rope line. Getting all of them by, sick. By or definition, not. he's yeah. shaking everybody's hands. And then he goes to the Waffle House to buy food f for the staff and daps up everybody in the Waffle House. I mean, like, come on, this is just not serious. So I, I, if you're a Democratic elected official, you're watching people try to defend Joe Biden, and that's the best they can do. 
you do not want to be that person and you do not want to put yourself in that position. So I do not think he can possibly stay because Democrats will increasingly look to themselves as having to do what what those people are doing. So I, I do want to say one thing about Coons. I, I, I've I've gotten gone into a bit of a schadenfreude spiral watching Coons carry water for for Trump I mean, for Biden and try to do this stuff. And what's interesting, we've all said, we've talked about this a lot internally about how if the plan was to get rid of Biden this week would still look very much like it's looked because you have to sort of say, right, we're behind him. We're not forcing him out because you got to give him the room to make it seem like he's doing a selfless act and not being chased out of Washington because he's a stubborn, intellectually insecure old man. But even Coons says and Nancy Pelosi and all of these people say over and over and over, even Mika Brzezinski say over and over again, the way he has, to, what he has to do to fix this is give lots of unscripted interviews, town halls. He needs to get out in front of the American people and, and show that he's up for the job. I don't think they're saying that as a matter of sort of just blanket punditry and advice. I think it is a subtle way of signaling to Biden to say, hey, look, your biggest supporters say this is what you need to do. And if you don't think you can do this de minimis stuff, this sort of politics 101 stuff for anybody running for any office, never mind the president of the United States, to reassure voters, then you got to make this call and get out. Because like, if, if you were really 100% behind Biden, that wouldn't be your talking point. Your talking point would be, look, he, does, he can do the job from the White House. He doesn't need to be out there. He's not a spring chicken, but that stuff doesn't matter. They're saying it matters intensely and enormously. And I think that that's, it's sort of like saying, look, Jonah, you can't be the editor-in-chief of the dispatch anymore if you can't dunk a basketball. We're totally behind you. But if you can't dunk a basketball, <laughs> right? it's like, you know I can't dunk a basketball. <laughs> right. So you're sort of setting that up implicit in the standard. I think that's more true of somebody like Chris Coons than it is of Mika Brzezinski, who seems to just be really siloed. But but to finish my my point, I will go along with at least part of what you're asking, Sarah. I think you're probably right. Both of you are probably right that the most likely thing, if Joe Biden does not remain the Democratic presumptive nominee, is that Kamala Harris will get it for all the reasons that you've suggested. Um, I, I certainly don't think that's the best outcome. And I think if you take Democrats at face value. And there are reasons to be skeptical that they really mean this. But if you if you believe that Democrats as a class, as a party, truly believe that Donald Trump is an existential threat to the public, it's imperative to prevent that. So you should do whatever you need to do to prevent that outcome. And that does not mean running the person who is supposedly in line or be, you know because you might piss off one political group or another. It means run a ticket that can win. And I think that's an argument Democrats internally can make to one another to say, look, Kamala Harris's uh, polling numbers are not much better than Joe Biden. And while it's true that she can complete a sentence in a way that he can't, she often completes a sentence and then goes on these meandering things that are easily mocked. She's not likable. She was a disastrous candidate in the Democratic primaries. There's no reason that we should settle for her when we could pick a dream team of Gretchen Whitmer and Raphael Warnock or put Andy Bashir on a ticket. And I think that would be very appealing to a lot of people. I'm not a Democrat and I don't think like a Democrat. So there are all sorts of reasons. I mean, I have lots of blind spots in this, but it seems to me that if you truly believe that Trump is an existential threat, and I think they're right to say it, I think we've seen that sometimes they act on that, sometimes they don't. That's the way that you, you say, look, we are going to create this other option, door number four or five or 50 or whatever it is. As Norm Ornstein has pointed out, um, if Biden resigns, there is no vice president. No easy path to get one confirmed either. So Mike Johnson would be the next in line under the rules of succession. So look, I this I week also, on West Wing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, there's no world in which Biden actually resigns the presidency, even if it would help Harris to be the incumbent, which I think it would. And Steve, this maybe gets to your point. A lot of these options would actually increase the chances of Democrats to win in November. Yes, door number four with different candidates obviously increases their chances in November. Not going to happen. Biden resigning the presidency to let Harris be president, let people sort of get used to that, I think increases their chances, despite Jonah's very excellent wag the dog point. 
Um, it's not going to happen because Joe Biden's never going to acknowledge that he wasn't up to the job. And I think they have a pretty good argument that if he were to acknowledge that he wasn't up to the job, it's not like he just became not up to the job today or whatever day he resigns. There would then be all these recriminations of how long was he basically not acting as president? How long did Harris know he couldn't really act as president? Who was the acting president during those times? That would hurt the Democratic Party as well. Um, I think that's a problem for Harris, by the way. Like, if you think that door number four is, is not is not an option. Like one of the strongest arguments against Kamala Harris is she was in theory working alongside Joe Biden for all this time and didn't say anything, yep. um, you know, didn't raise these alarms. I think that's a I think that would be a, a really difficult uh, point for her to argue against. Can we take a moment on the media question? Because this is a, you know, conversation we've been having internally. Um, is it the case that reporters I'll give you more doors? <laughs> One, reporters were covering this the whole time, so I don't know what you're talking about. Two, reporters were trying to shill for Joe Biden. They knew how infirm he was um, and didn't tell the American people. They've been lying. And door number three is uh, they, you know, Republicans were the ones saying that Joe Biden was the problem, you know, had a problem. And this is a different type of bias because of who the messenger was. They didn't believe the message. They didn't look into the message. They weren't curious about it. And so they didn't know that Joe Biden was like this until they saw the debate. But they also didn't check. And how much do you think this will undermine credibility of the media moving forward as we put it up against things like the origins of COVID or the Hunter Biden laptop, other stories in which it's not that I think reporters knew where COVID originated. Of course, they didn't and still don't. Or that they knew the laptop was real. It's that the people saying that those things were people they don't like to associate themselves with or justify. Um, and therefore, they didn't look too hard into it. And I'll read this one line from a CNN story that I just thought was pretty egregious. I mean, this is CNN's own reporting on why they didn't cover the story more. Like all presidents, Biden has good days and bad days. It can be tricky to report on something as difficult to define as a person aging. When his opponent is a convicted felon who regularly lies and has threatened to use the government to go after his political opponents. Why would it be more difficult to report on someone's aging because of who they're running against? It's totally irrelevant to getting the story, except if you think you don't want that story out there because it could help his opponent, in which case we get into this sort of activism journalism problem. And I know, Steve, you think about this so much and so often. So which one do you think is more accurate in terms of, you know, what reporters knew and when they knew it? Yeah. So I think it's it's somewhere in the middle. Um, But uh, I I don't think either side, I mean, this is sort of goes back to Jonah's rejection of monocausal explanations for everything. I think there are multiple causes. Um, if you look at what reporters did to cover Biden's age question, they co- some reporters covered it, right? We've mentioned here two years ago, Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns wrote this book in which they covered it. They came on uh, the Dispatch podcast, talked about it at, at length. Alex Burns said, this is in April or May of, I think it was in May of 2022, said this is a massive concern for Democrats, right? Biden's age and mental acuity problems, massive concern for Democrats. He said that two years ago. So there was some reporting on it. The Wall Street Journal has done reporting on it. The New York Times has done some reporting on it. The problem is, I think the reporting hasn't been as vigorous as it could have been. And it was often sort of counterbalanced by skepticism, exactly along the lines of what you say, Sarah, where, you know, Republicans were making this a big deal and Democrat, the Trump world was doing this. Fox News was, of course, obsessed with the Biden age question. And there's this uh, there's this instinct, I think, from most Republicans, because they're on the left, to be defensive most about reporters. that. And most, yeah, sorry, most reporters to be defensive about that. And uh, I think I think we saw evidence of that. But there is also, I mean, this was, you know, there was, I, I did this podcast with uh, Tim Miller at The Bulwark after we wrote our editorial in March, in which we argued, in effect, Donald Trump is a, a manifestly unfit to be president of the United States. He's a unique threat to the, to the republic. Uh, but Joe Biden isn't the answer. 
And we took some grief and we said, Joe Biden, his biggest mistake as president has been not stepping aside to let somebody else do the job because it was pretty clear that he can't do the job. We had policy differences with him. We listed those policy differences. But the big problem was he was showing obvious signs of, of uh, mental challenges, um, cognitive challenges. And Tim's counter argument to me was, hey, no, that doesn't, you know, you, you sort of need to either be for Biden or you need to be for Trump. And if you're not for Trump, you have to get behind Joe Biden. And we had this big discussion. It was, it was a, a very interesting discussion. And I hope I'm characterizing Tim's view correctly, where he said, in effect, like, you got to sort of be on a team or not be on a team. And, you know, we talked about some of the ways that people who are pro-Trump might approach these questions exactly along the lines of what you just read from the CNN report. And Tim conceded, yeah, does that mean sometimes that they would have to gild the lily? I think that was his exact phrase. And, said, and he said, yes. And I just said, look, my view on this is totally different. And it's very close to what you articulated, Sarah. You got to go and tell the story. You got to chase the story. You got to find out what's true. And then you got to report it. And I think part of what we saw from, from reporters is there was this sense that he was having these problems. You know, it, it wasn't all hidden. It, you know, the, the White House, I think, went to great lengths to keep this from reporters as much as they could. Even, I mean, there, there are, I've talked to people um, at major networks, newspapers, who've told me stories about the White House calling them and berating them for even raising the questions about this. This was an active campaign by the Biden team to shame reporters not to cover this thing. But even if you allow for that, there was just this lack of sort of vigorous follow-up about, about the stuff that we were seeing in public, you know, the, the reading the teleprompter cues and things like that. Matthew Dowd, who's a longtime pundit, used to be a Republican strategist and now is basically a Democrat and advises Democrats. He, he raised this in, in a, a, a series of, of tweets and actually went after analysts who would basically tell the truth and said, in effect, you shouldn't be telling the truth. He, he tweeted, I would ask pundits who are anti-Trump, how do they think they are helping defeat Trump by constantly undermining only current opposition to beat him. Also, do you think the president or White House is going to be influenced by your calls for him to step down? Then he followed that up by saying, just because you believe something to be true, it doesn't mean you have to say it if it isn't helpful. I just, I find that absolutely stunning. And it seems to, to have never occurred to Matthew Dowd that the job here is to tell the truth. Like that's the business we're in. We're in the truth business. So Jonah, and I think we're seeing the problems with this in the other uh, the way this has been reported. Jonah, I, th I think some of the pushback that I've heard is, well, if they were covering it the whole time, like covering up the whole time, why would they be covering it so vigorously now? Um, and unfortunately, I think that just like Steve, you were saying like, well, I'm not a Democrat. I don't think like a Democrat. I think there's sort of a failure of imagination to realize what a lot of people think at this point, which is the reason that they're covering it now is because they don't think Biden can win against Trump anymore. So it's still about beating Donald Trump. And they're actually just still kind of proving that point that, well, once everyone saw the debate, it was like an oh no moment. You know, this was never about Joe Biden. It was about beating Donald Trump. And I guess I am concerned that this just further solidifies that narrative for a lot of people that all journalism is activist journalists at that point. Yeah. I, look, I, I, I think it's, um, a little from every, from behind every door, or I, mean, I don't know why you've abandoned your buckets to use doors, but whatever. Um, uh, I do think, um, I agree with everything that Steve said directionally and all that. And I have such deja vu about the exact same arguments, uh, when you tell the truth about Donald Trump. Right. And, um, but it's worth pointing out, like Tim Miller is a longtime political comms consultant, you know, kind of guy. And Matthew Dowd, same thing. These are people who start from different assumptions about how you do politics than reporters or opinion journalists do. And then and Tim Miller, who I've had a lot of disagreements with, you know, of late, to his credit, he is now in the the gaslighting isn't helping camp on a lot right. of this stuff, right? Um, 
the embarrass I agree, the Hadass Gold, that's the author, the reporter from CNN, where I'm a contributor, um, that you read that, that line from, that's bad. That's a sort of like, oh my gosh, did I say that out loud? kind of thing i couldn't believe it yeah it's, it's not quoted it's just yeah. written as straight journalism yeah I, I think it's very bad i find there are all sorts of analogies that come to mind with all of this stuff uh steve and i when we were at fox we used to talk about this all the time about the what we would call the fox news effect which is that if the if fox took a story really seriously it gave permission to the rest of the mainstream media not to cover it properly correct if you know Benghazi, if fox cares a lot about benghazi so benghazi can't really matter that much it was that kind of thing. Um, one of the examples I often use when I'm talking about this is the, 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 the sexual impropriety stories at Fox, which were legitimate when uh, they came out about Bill O'Reilly and all the other gross stuff that was going on. The reaction from a lot of the gitchy goo media critics and reporters was to say, my gosh, see, this proves how gross Fox is. This is a problem because right wingers are misogynist pigs. And because they couldn't muster the imagination to think maybe this has more to do with just like powerful men in media across the media, regardless of ideology, it took a couple more years before the Me Too stuff came out, where it turned out that, oh, look at all these scummy guys on, you know, for classic liberal guys um, were bad, were bad dudes, too. And we find this with like the border. Uh, I think there was a lot of poo pooing at the idea there was a crisis at the border. And then all of a sudden, when it became impossible for Biden politically not to say there was a crisis at the border, all of a sudden, a lot of journalists started calling it a crisis at the border. So, I, I mean, I think one of the things you got to tease out is like, you, if we just say blanketly the media, you're going to be unfair to some people because some people in the media behave responsibly. And, all, you know, people like Matt Dowd, he had partisan brain when he was a Republican, and now he has partisan brain because he's a Democrat. But, I, you know, I... I Think back, you know, like Jake Tapper, who I think has been doing a really aggressive and good job in the last week since the debate. Um, you know, his interview with Chris Coons was just brutal. Um, he's the one who got Kareem Jean Pierre to say, Look, I can't even keep up with him about Joe Biden. Um, and that was like a year ago. And if 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 she can't keep up with Joe Biden, you know, I I, I we gotta get a health check on her, right? Um, and so I think that there's there's a big partisan soup atmosphere that the, that the mainstream media generally operates within and they buy these assumptions and they turn these things into partisan, you know, Republicans pounce kind of stories. I don't I agree with you that some people in the media are covering this well now because they've made the calculation they got to get Biden out of there to help beat Trump. I agree. That's certainly the motivation of the New York Times editorial board, right? There's no other universe in which they do that except that calculation. And they said so. Yeah. There are other people who I think feel like they really screwed the pooch and now they're trying to overcompensate in the other direction. And there are sources that are available now that wouldn't yeah. have dreamed of yeah. talking to a reporter, even on background before the debate. I think that's absolutely something that is not only worth highlighting, you know, underline, etc. These stories wouldn't exist pre-debate because you wouldn't have had the sources for them. Right. But, you know, there's the Rob Herr report. There's the Wall Street Journal story that had Republican sources of people who had met with Biden. And those weren't just not followed up on the way that I think they would have been if they had been similar stories about Trump saying something insane in the Oval Office, but with Democrats being the witnesses for it. Um, they were attacked. Rob think, Herr, how many stories about Rob Herr? Well, he yeah. wants a judicial yeah. nomination from Donald Trump if he wins again. He's a partisan hack. Let me tell you all the things about, you know, what Rob Herr was like at eight years old when he pushed some kid on the playground, you know, as a Republican eight-year-old. Um, instead <laughs> of, this guy is testifying under penalty of perjury right. as to what he witnessed in three hours with Donald Trump. I wonder who else has had conversations like that. I, I find it Trump. Pretty, Sorry, sorry. Let me just redo that. This guy had three hours of conversations with Joe Biden. Um, gee, I wonder who else has had experiences like that, even if I can't get them on the record, even if they're not from the political party that I want. You know, they're sure finding a lot of people now. I doubt that none of them were willing to talk before the debate. I'd find that hard to believe. I just think they're shaking the trees, sh shaking more trees, shaking the trees harder. Um, and a lot of fruit is falling to the ground. Okay. Um, 
Last thought on all of this. Does any of this change who Donald Trump picks as vice president, as his vice presidential running mate, at least? Uh, let me just. Does any of this change who Donald Trump picks as his vice presidential running mate? Lightning round. Steve Hayes. Uh, I, it could. I think he had sort of narrowed it down to three. I believe the reporting, I've done some reporting on this myself, talked to a number of uh, current and former Republicans, including people who are talking directly to Trump about this choice. I believe the reporting that we'd seen elsewhere uh, over the past two weeks that the choice had been down to basically J.D. Vance, Marco Rubio, uh, and Doug Burgum. I think my own sense is that last week, sort of Vance and, and Rubio were leading candidates. Um, Burgum seems to have had some recovery this week. I think those were and and probably remain the, the top candidates. I have heard about uh, conversations that the Trump team has had in the past uh, several days, um, reviving the idea that he could look at Nikki Haley. Um, I, I think she would accept it if he offered it. I think it's highly unlikely that Trump would actually do that and go there. Um, but I think they're having those conversations mindful of the the possibility that they could be facing Kamala Harris or somebody other than Joe Biden. Yeah, I, I think the most obvious consequence in the VP thing is it delays it, right? Because they're not going to want to make this pick until they know exactly who they're running against. And that yep. makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, I think, I don't think he picks Nikki Haley because he had, Sussum's reporting a while back that said, look, at the end of the day, you just got to like the person you're running with. And I don't like her. And I don't think, you know, I mean, we're talking about how stubborn Joe Biden is. Donald Trump's kind of stubborn too. So I, I, I don't see that that happening um i suspect it would be marco rubio i i suspect this helps marco rubio and burgo more than vance um if biden does, stays in the race and runs i think then it helps vance the more confident trump feels like he can he's going to win the better vance's chances are the more he feels like it's going to be a race and a close call the more it helps Rubio, uh, Rubio, I think. All right. And with that, happy 4th of July, everyone. And uh, let's put a link to the show notes, Jonah, to that speech. Yeah. Your wish is someone's command. Not mine. <laughs> I don't know how to get that in the show notes. <laughs> happy Independence Day. All right. We're out. See you guys.